Hi, I'm Tudor Morgan. I work with Herds of Green Expeditions and I've been lucky enough to be involved in Antarctica for 20 plus years. Um, I'm here with <laughs> John Chardin. Nice to see everybody. And uh, yeah, I've been going to Antarctica uh, actually since the mid 90s, but with uh, with Herta Gruden since 2002. And we met a little bit after that. Yeah, we I met think. pretty soon after that. But yeah. what, what first took you to Antarctica, John? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, I'll try to keep it short, but um, I'd done some cruising in the Arctic um, and um, basically the invitation was there. And I mean, for a seabird guy, it's yeah. a dream come true, right? And, yeah. And you know, when you go once, yeah, you've got to keep on going. Yeah, you've got to keep on going. Yeah. And I've had people, you have too. Yeah. Why, how can you go down there again? It must seem yeah. like suddenly it must be yeah. old to you. But no, it, in fact, it, yeah. you get the bug and then... And, and I remember, you know, on board, one of our guests, you know, said, oh, I've seen you before. I said, yeah, oh, this is my fifth cruise to Antarctica. Yeah. And you're like, wow. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. But it, <laughs> it captures us all. We have to keep on going back. Exactly. You can't let go. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So we, we first met in, I think we were working out earlier, in 2007. Right. On the Nord Norg. That's and right. the Nord Norg was our first ship that went down there in 2002. Yeah. And you were on it. And I was on it. On so, the, not, I was on the very first trip as well. So we, uh, we sailed the ship, or, or they sailed the ship yeah. down from Norway, direct, I guess, yeah. as quick as they could, to Ushuaia. And then on the 8th of November, yeah. they were there for a couple of days to prepare and that sort of thing. And on the 8th of November, we, uh, we sailed. And why, why did Hedsgruten go to Antarctica? I mean, they're a Norwegian ferry company. Exactly, yeah. I, you know, the history of it needs to be written down and documented. But as far as I understand it, somebody in the company had a, a bright idea, a very good idea, that uh, winter on the coast is, is quiet. It yeah. was then, it's it was not, then. not yeah. anymore. And um, we can spare a ship. There was however many ships on yeah. the coast at that point. We'll spare a ship and send it to Antarctica. And of rest, all places. And the rest is history. Yeah. Like 20 years later, we're still going and we've got three ships exactly. operating there this season. Exactly. Yeah. And that, even though that was our first time, that was a super successful season. Mm. I mean, we went right yeah. till March. We stayed the, the whole time down yeah. there and, and then came back. And, you know, because you've been, I, I only, I'm a newcomer to Hurtigruten since 2007. <laughs> you've been there a long time. But what... What's the change through in the 20 years, you know, the, from when Nord Norga and Nord Cap went down compared with now where we've got yeah. Fram, Marmonson and Nansen all operating? What, yeah. what, what do you see as the big change? You mean on board at least? Um, I mean, we had pretty big teams at the time, but not as big as we yeah. do now. Um, yeah. And um, everything was manual, right? I mean, the Xerox machine saved our lives so many times because that was the way we communicated yeah. with our guests right? yeah there was no internet yeah um so everything was paper copy and yeah. that was a big evolution to get that flowing so yeah. that it, it worked properly yeah. yeah and i think the the thing that i've really noticed in in my time and um, i did a few things before her to group me in antarctica but the the really big thing i've noticed is you know back Back in the early days, we were saying we were sounding really old, a bit yeah, great now. Yeah, we? well, yeah. But the back in the early days, we had, you know, we just took the ship there, and the destination spoke for itself. Exactly. You know, so the the program yeah. was, oh, we're going to go to A, B, and yeah. C, and have an amazing time, and everyone did have an amazing time. Yeah. And in terms of preparation, as I feel that our trips now are a lot more curated. We we have we have a plan. Uh, totally. We, in terms of the content we deliver, we have amazing ornithologists like you um, yeah. giving incredible lectures but also backing that up with other um, other activities whether it be you know in the science center well, I guess we'll talk about the science center and our ships in a yeah. bit but I think the the preparedness and the having a voyage with a sense of purpose um, now it, it was sort of back in the day it was a bit like the cowboy times wasn't it it was sort of like oh well, let's let's go yeah and off we went but we yeah. had a great fun, well, but it's still great fun now, but just in a different framework. We're, we're more controlled. It's a more controlled environment now. Yeah. We'll talk about that yeah. uh, later, I yeah. think, in terms of sustainability. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of, in, you know, I'm, I'm very involved with IATO, which is the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. Well done. And, and that started in 1991, <clears throat> which ran in parallel with the, um, the Antarctic Treaty Committee for Environmental Protocol. Lots of 
um, and acronyms, <laughs> but that, that spelled out that any um, private sector tourism to Antarctica should have an educational element. So for me, that's kind of where uh, our education programmes on board were born, because mm. you couldn't just go to a place and say, speak for itself. We had to tell, to justify going there for our permits. We had to tell the guests what we were doing. But in, in terms of, you know, lectures and things, which we, used to, which we still do a lot of now, I remember, you know, the old slide carousels. <laughs> and, then it, and then it'd fall out, and yes. it'd be like click, 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 and then rolling sea with a screen hanging and rocking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, it really did happen to me once. I remember where I had all my slides. And by the way, putting a slideshow together in a carousel is the best way of getting seasick. I think of, of any. <laughs> well, that's a big improvement. Any. No slides. <laughs> all power. That's a big improvement. But then, of course, the, the ship rocked once. It wasn't on our, one of our ships. Our ships are very stable. And, it, yeah. and I've never had this happen on our ships. But another ship I was on, it rocked. And of course, all the slides went. No way. It was like. 59 pickup or whatever you call it yeah yeah that was it that was the end of the lecture that's it right everyone needs to lie down now feeling a bit sick oh yeah. yeah yeah in terms of you know the guest preparedness you know we were talking about that auto and talking about education now we, we do operate under more guidelines and procedures um for sites you know as an industry we've come together and produced site guidelines and we've had a hand in those site guidelines in mm -hmm. terms of how they're operated and how we work and is have you seen that as a big positive impact in you know in leaving no trace or absolutely for sure i mean we we were very careful in the early days as yeah. well um but i think the the skill of what we do partly and is that we 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 do what we do but it's not obvious yeah. we're not like we're not police. Yeah. We're not down there no. to be police. Yeah. But we we're careful with what we do, mm. um, and the guests don't even notice it almost. Yeah. I think. And I, I think, you know, the, one of the things when the expedition team go ashore, and this, this hasn't changed at all, you know, that setting up no, the that's... landing, and, yes. and making putting safe places. We use flags. We use traffic cones. Where but the to just guide, yeah, just things, to protect yeah. the wildlife. To get to the best places with, um, get the best places in view for the guests and yeah. you know position you near a penguin colony and you can you can talk all day about penguins. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that part hasn't changed yeah. in a sense. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I think what we do, um, we make a lot more connections when we're on board in terms yeah. of the history part and the science center. Like you said, we talk about that. We're going to talk about that more. Uh, art we we connect mm. and it's multi-dimensional what we yeah. do i think mm. on board yeah. more now than we used to yeah. it was very much okay we're on a landing we're we're yeah. going out landing we didn't cruise much back then did we no so it was much. just all landing, landing everybody landing. Every, everybody wanted yeah. to go on land yeah. yeah but i think i mean that that is a really good thing i think now is we you know the the cruising when we take people out in the small boats it's such a different oh it's medium yeah. And it's so calm and relaxing and you just see it a whole different perspective. Yeah. And then guests that yeah. go kayaking, I think is is amazing, you because know, that's so different again. Yeah. And then we do, you know, camping and you know, just being in the Antarctic night, which isn't very night like, but the change of yeah. light. And it's just magic. Yeah. So I think those those type before it was just landing, 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 but now the broad spread of activities. I think really in heart, I love it. You know, yeah, in exactly. Kayaking, it's and you, you remember that? I mean, we. I think our thinking was in those days that everybody wanted to land all the time, landing, yeah. landing, two landings a day, morning and afternoon. It was a success if you did three. Yeah, you remember exactly. That? Like, yeah, let's go. Exactly. Yeah. But it was kind of a, a pleasant surprise to us how mm. how the guests loved the cruising yeah. in particular. Yeah. Of course, kayaking as well, yeah. and hiking and snowshoeing and all that we do now. Yeah. yeah. But also, I think oh, now camping, camping, camping too. Yeah. yeah, but I think now a big difference is we've we've slowed down the pace a bit. So we slowed the pace, so we removed the you know the quantity element, but put a lot more quality in it. So yeah. you get a lot more. That's a good. A point. lot more out of it yeah. by having the activities, the landing, the boat cruising, yeah. the onboard lectures, the science and education program. I think that really sort of enhances the understanding 
yes. of the place. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. You so, still need a holiday when you come back home, though. Yeah, you, you, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the team really need a holiday when they're done. But in terms of the the science or the program, if you like, on board, now, you know, we talked about the lectures, but, you know, we do a lot more now. So what would be your sort of big highlight from, in, in terms of the added things we do now compared yeah. with 20 years ago? Well, I mean, thinking about on board itself, I mean, you can't forget this amazing science center that we have on board where we can uh, use microscopes to look at yeah. things in close up. We can, uh, with permission, with permits, we can actually yeah. make collections of, let's say, algae or something yeah. like that, look at that under the microscope, get a much better understanding of of the the environment because you look, you, you know, you, mm. you've done this, I'm sure, you you see all these seabirds, and we'll talk about seabirds too later, albatrosses, but you see them flying around the ocean, but you you almost never see any food in the ocean. Yeah. It just looks like water. Barren. Barren, barren land, water. Yeah. And then yeah. when you actually sieve it and, and see what's living in that, yeah. you, then you really realize, right, what's in there what, and what's driving yeah. the whole system. Yeah. And the yeah. phytoplankton under a microscope oh. are the most incredible. Yeah. Creatures, I mean, yeah. creatures not the right word, yeah. but they're but, but, absolutely yeah. amazing, aren't they? It's yeah. like a sci-fi film. I think yeah. that's where all the sci-fi uh, bugs uh, come from. They've just done a, a plankton <laughs> troll. And, uh, but, yeah, but you yeah, never used to yeah. see that. No. We love looking at whales and think, nobody thinks, well, what do they eat? Are they eat krill? What do the krill eat? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, exactly. But that whole yeah. ecosystem that we can share. And many of our guests have never been exposed to that. And yeah. it's such a simple thing to be able to do yeah. it. You need the right equipment, and we've got that, so it, yeah. it works really And with that, well. I think it just opens up that in curiosity and inquisitiveness in, mm-hmm. in ourselves. And every time I see it, I get excited. And we're getting excited talking about it now. Yeah, yeah. But it really does um, fire the imagination. And I think that, you know, that connection with looking at a whale or a seal and go, what do they eat? Uh, here we go. This is what mm-hmm. they eat. This is the base of the yeah. ecosystem, the food chain. And uh, it's incredible. Now, I, I have a question for you because you've been going down longer than me because you worked yeah. on land previously yeah. there. Yeah. And everybody's interested, you know, what have you seen in 20, 25, 30 years going down? Mm. Have you seen anything tangible by way of climate change yeah. Or, yeah. or anything like that? Mm. The, the real big thing that happened with me was um, I, I wintered in Antarctica. And when, when the sun came back, and it, that was there early enough that the, the ozone hole still existed or the ozone thinning. Oh, right, yeah. So the, the burn factor of the sun was really severe. So you used to go out even with full sunblock on and you'd get, you'd get really burned. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, the ozone hole, the thinning, is, has been reduced. You know? mm-hmm. So that's a good news story that you know, humans have made a change banning CFCs. Mm-hmm. So it was a big drive. Um, we all remember that. But I think the, the, as we see changes you know i remember when we used to sail you know all back even in 2007 a lot of the hanging glaciers say like in Le Maire channel there seemed to be a lot more ice but now later in the season it's, it's bare rock so there's that physical change yeah um and then also you know in terms of species diversity you know you really notice you know when i first went in 1994 we rarely saw any whales we just didn't oh, see them, really? but now it's um, you know the the humpback whale oh, yeah. populations are incredible. Yeah, and you just especially December onwards, I December guess, because they take a little bit, they yeah. take a bit of time to get down there. But right? actually, I was I was lucky enough. Now I've just come back from a, a trip um, on Nansen, which was fantastic. So a few days ago, I got back, and guests were asking, "Will we see whales?" I was like, "Well, it's a little bit early, but we saw quite a lot." We saw uh, we saw minkies. Oh, okay. oh, we saw good. quite a lot. Not not compared with December and January. Uh, we also also saw a blue whale, which was just off Deception Island. Fantastic! Wow. Yeah, it was hot. Well, it was a blue Amazing. whale. You could just see that you don't see much of whales, do you? Yeah. Know, especially a blue whale. Yeah, but it was but, definitely a blue. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so, but you're, I mean, you're, you're the man to talk about penguins because you're the you're penguin specialist. I mean, the thing that jumps to my mind is um, in the later years, how much snow falls in the, in the wintertime. And when you go down early, uh, November, let's say, yeah. how much snow is sitting on top of the penguin colonies yeah. compared to 20, 25 years ago. Um, 
and I think this year is a classic example of that, right? We've, yeah. we've got reports of the, 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 the hut at Port Lockray being completely Buried covered. Buried two yeah. metres, yeah. And Damway yeah. too, yeah. I think. Yeah. But I think th- it, it, this year, I think with, with, with the winters, there hasn't been so much ice. It's not, you know, there's no, uh, there probably, somebody has probably done some analysis. But particularly this year, there was very little sea ice. Sea ice, right. So you got a lot of precipitation because the, the warming of the, the sea was warmer. Yeah. So you just got lots and lots of snow. Whilst, you know, and we wouldn't even try to go south of the Mare Channel this early on. No. But now the, there's, there's less sea ice, uh, warmer temperatures, hence more pre- precipitation. Which is ironic because Antarctica is past the desert. Exactly. Because it's yeah. very so low precipitation, yeah. but the precipitation on the edges is, is high, exactly. especially now. And warming, you think yeah. warming, you know, why is it snowing yeah. more? But that's, yeah. that's the reason, more but humidity it, and, yeah. In terms of the success with the penguins, though, I mean, are we, are we seeing a greater breeding success or less with the snow? I mean, it takes... Yeah. Um, I, I, honestly, I... I don't think it's been studied that well in terms Mm. of a direct link to breeding success. Um, What it does do, though, is it shortens up the season because they can't get going. They need bare rock to lay their egg or eggs, and so they wait. And if that's December, they've got a fixed amount of time to incubate the egg and bring the chick off, and that could be April. Yeah. And if they're lucky and they have a warm uh, fall, autumn, Then they're okay, but if not, if winter comes, then they yeah. don't have enough time. And it's pretty cruel, isn't it? Because the parents yeah. just go, "We've had enough now. It's cold. We're leaving," and they just right. leave the chicks. Exactly. And say, yeah. "Right, guys, if you and girls, if you want to feed, you've got to go swimming." But then yeah. they've still got down, so it's really harsh. Yeah. But that's. And then I think the other connection is is with krill because the pe- many of the species of penguins really yeah uh, focus on krill as a food source. Gen two's not so much. And generally, there's less krill for whatever reason. Maybe they've moved. Yeah. Um, and so the krill specialists like chin straps and Adelis aren't doing so well as they yeah. used to, I think. That's another thing but, that's changed. There's the Peterman Island. Exactly. Where we used to, well, see, we, we still go, but we, we used to see a lot of Adelie penguins oh, there. Oh, yeah. But yeah. now I think there's one or two, but it's been taken yeah. over by gentoos. Why, why is right. that? Yeah. And that, that's an indirect effect from exactly Cla- what it's saying. a classic effect yeah. Yeah. yeah and i think there it seems to be um that that the adelis are more uh, focused and specialists for krill the yeah. krill isn't so available now as it used to be and gentoos yeah. are much more generalist they'll eat yeah. fish and other things and they're loving it they're loving the warming conditions yeah. it is really and i think that's a big change well both of us have seen in the change in the how you know, the gentoos have moved in. I yeah. remember, you know, we talked, yeah. about, well, I mentioned the Mayor Channel, but I don't remember 15, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, seeing gentoo penguin colonies in the Mayor Channel. Yeah. But there's those ones as you yeah, go yeah, south exactly. up on the left-hand yeah. side that you think, yeah. oh, they're really just desperate to find any real estate that yeah. they can nest. Yeah. But I don't remember those. I mean, I don't know whether it's my, you know, memory gets challenged. No, I think but, they are yeah. increasing. And I mean, I think the, the most southerly colony is on Peterman, at least on the peninsula, mm. right? They do, do they get any further south than the Peterman? There's Winter Island near Vernadsky, I think. That's oh, okay. It. Yeah, they're, I they're, think so. They're slowly going further I south. So you're they? right. Yeah. 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 But then when you go mm. deep south, like mm. we can do now, yeah. with uh, two of our ships at yeah. least, then, then it's mm. a deli, yeah. then it's a deli a country. Deli. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it, but back in, you know, Nord, Nord and Nord Cap, I don't but we didn't go that far south with no. them, did we? We just no. sort of did. Peterman. Dance. Peterman was about it. Nansky. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was it. Yeah. But yeah. now, um, Armington and Nansen, we've got um, PC6 hull, Polar Class 6 oh, hull, which is a lot of steel. So we can go uh, further south with the okay. ice, and we're doing itineraries down for. We've got these amazing 14 day itineraries further south. So that whole development yeah. of yeah. making purpose built ships. And you know, Fram is per, Fram was built two thousand and seven, launched two thousand and eight. Um, so they're mm-hmm. expedition vessels, which I think is a big change as well, because Nord Norg and Nordcap were, uh, they were, you know, they they ran from the Norwegian coast. They were built for the Norwegian yeah. coast. Whilst now we do have those um, those purpose built ships yeah. to really it, enable us to. It's amazing those ships did so well when you yeah. think about it. They, yeah. they, they were taken off the coast with a, really a different 
purpose yeah. built for the yeah. coast with a car deck, for example, yeah. and and yet mm. the seasons were yeah. incredible. But I think from yeah. the, you know, I remember on Lord Nog, you know, to get in the boat, you know, you went down into the car deck. Right. You went out of sort of the pilot <laughs> door onto a sort of rickety uh, aluminium. It was about this But way. it all worked. Yeah, yeah. But, you but, know, now we have the purpose built. We've got the tender hangar where the boats are stored. We've got the, you know, the side of the ship comes down, which we call the tender pit. Exactly. You know, so yeah. it's all purpose. So that, the, the, you know, the safety, the guest experience, you know, the guest flow, it's so, so much more uh, easier for the guest it's, now to yeah, just, it is. you know, and, yeah. and, you know, which makes it easier for us in terms of delivering that experience. Um, so I think that's, that's a really good, Thing about having a, a ship, and yeah, and I mean we've done we've been really good at learning. Um, every mm. every landing, yeah. every year, yeah. every season, we learn more, and you can really see from. I wish we had some snapshots from the beginning. We do have pictures, yeah, but almost to be go to go back to see what it was like there to experience mm. what yeah. it was like, and you'd really see a big difference. I, I think we've probably got rose tinted specs about the old days as oh, well, yeah. you know, because it's oh, like ah, it all was perfect, but oh, you know, yeah. we were probably oblivious to all yeah. the things that the expedition leaders of the day were pulling the hair out, um, trying to make it work. Thomas, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then in terms of you know that that ship, you know the the Anson and Nansen are now you know the hybrid vessels. Um, which of course you know we've got battery packs on board, so yeah. then you know it's like a hybrid car. When we're when we're operating, we you know when the generators need more power, instead of starting a new generator, or then we just take the power from the battery bank. When we underperform, it takes it off. Yeah. The heating system, you know, the hot water on the ship for everybody's showers, for example. Does it come from the? It comes from the heat from the engines. Heat. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. So the efficiency yeah. of the whole design, you know, it's just yeah. so we are. For a ship a similar size and weight and everything, we're we're burning about twenty percent less fuel by yeah. all the technology in the ship. So I think you know that investment in that process is a big change as well. So if you, you know, we 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 say, and I think we 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 practice what we preach that in terms of we're the most sustainable operator. You know, we can't hide from the fact that we're burning fuel, but we're doing everything we can to reduce our impact in terms of emissions, in terms of, exactly. um, you know, we banned heavy fuel oil years yeah. and years ago, so long ago, I can't remember. Uh, Single-use plastic we banned in 19, uh, sorry, 2018. Yeah, okay. Uh, 2017, yeah. 2018. Um, there are all those initiatives. And I think a big change this, this year is our food, all our food for the Antarctic operations is locally sourced in Argentina and Chile. Um, there's a few little items we can't get, but we're mm. using local suppliers. So the amazing Argentinian beef and lamb Fantastic. is coming straight onto the ship. The we've, wine got, and everything. we've got an agreement with an Argentinian vineyard uh, that's supplying our, yeah. wine, our house wines. Um, you know, even vegetables and fruit. I was I was lucky <clears> enough to go to um, before my trip to Antarctica a few weeks ago uh, to go to the locals, see all the local supplies and the the effort and energy to bring all the those in. Um, but that sort of circular economy of investing in the local community, um, bringing those food in, you know, it's a real challenge. It's the easiest mm. thing, which we used to do. Yeah, bring was, We would have shipped 45, 40 foot containers of food for the season. Yeah. But it's all been purchased locally. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a big change because, yeah. And, and lots of other operators still do that. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing for me in terms of sustainability is uh, the whole idea of how powerful time is when you when you have that time factor. Very tiny things can have a cumulative big effect mm. over long enough time. People, for example, sometimes, not often, but when we tell them, no, you can't take a rock from that beach in Antarctica. Yeah. And they would their immediate reaction, well, not all of them, like I said, but why can't I? I mean, look, there's thousands. It's there's <laughs> and yeah. and you have to say, well, but even though that little thing is so small, you multiply it by thousands or millions of people and a uh, hundred years, five hundred yeah. years from now, yeah. then it has this huge so there's that's a real challenge for sustainability, I think, is 
to make sure that even the tiny things we do don't accumulate yeah. Uh, yeah. over a long period yeah. of time and become yeah. a problem, yeah. basically. But of course, yeah. Antarctica is very protected and we can't take anything out of Antarctica. Nothing. Nothing. No. And we no. can't, uh, we're not allowed to eat ashore. Uh, we don't, um, in terms of that impact. So it's very, yeah. very controlled and in, in our permitting to operate is very, you know, restricts that. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of, you can't do this, you can't do that. But, it, but the experience is is amazing in giving that experience but i think yeah having that sustainability or focus of leaving a footprint we're proud of really working on you know memories and experiences and you can't you can't get those elsewhere right you, and and i think the amazing you know people have said to me why would i want to go to antarctica because i can just watch a david attenborough film and and with that but that seeing in <laughs> in and believing is incredible and really powerful and yeah. one of the things we were talking about is you know creating ambassadors and you know so people can exactly. see that and go away and learn and and really take these little findings from home you know if we can um talk about plastic uh, on the ship and whether we don't use single use plastic and then people go home and think you know, don't take carry bags yeah you know what they buy in the plastic system market. Forks and like, because yeah. consumers you have the power don't you when you're home when you're on the ship we just give you this is what you're given and mm -hmm. you don't you get what you're given and you don't get upset yeah but at home you have the choice exactly uh, and we've made the choice for you when you're on the ship uh but i think that's really powerful the messages that we can share about how we how we operate mm. and how we do things i think something that changes people too is just simple things like you know when we're talking about guidelines and watching where you step for example and uh not stepping on any vegetation in it in, in antarctica um that makes people think right because yeah. i mean they're i mean why can't i step on that i mean i step on my lawn at home yeah. and if you explain to them if you make the connection yeah. with why that lichen that you haven't stepped on is is a hundred yeah. years old and has been there and it's got a really tough life you know, they, they it begins to think. They begin to think, and it changes them. Yeah. You know, it changes their the way they view living things. It's this mindset, isn't it, that yeah. we have, and everything is on our hands. But you know, that that mindset change is really powerful. And I think on all our cruises all over the world, we we use the same uh, the same framework mm -hmm. on how we do it. I think one one of the things we haven't talked about, which I think is a really big change, is is in our science program. That we have these, we ha we dedicate cabins to guest scientists, and I think those those guest scientists really add to the guest experience. Yeah. Uh, they also we giving the ship as a platform for them to do their work. Yes. Uh, when we talked about whales, and I know you know we've got lots of, um, I know we'd love to have loads of bird scientists, but we've got lots of whale scientists, particularly this year, looking at the the health and genetics of particularly humpback whales. Um, doing survey data because there's not much known about the yeah. Antarctic population of whales um, so a lot of work surveying because we've got to collect data but because we're going back and forth to Antarctica on these trips you know for a whole season we can provide a big data set well not us providing it but, but yeah. the scientists doing that nope. um, so there's a lot of projects and then when they come back on board and then they share their experiences, they share what they've seen yeah. um, with with the guests. I think it's um, it's really, yeah, it's powerful, it's first hand yeah. science. Totally, I mean, uh, when you look at our expedition teams, many of them are, were, or are, yeah. are professional scientists yeah. uh, that have decided to career, make a career change career or education. whatever, education, and, yeah. and become educators, essentially. But the guests, are interacting with them all the time of course on board but to see a working scientist you know yeah. somebody who's right in the middle of it um, doing their their yeah. trade doing their business on board uh, doing all the sorts of things they do that that has to uh, impact the guests I think yeah. you know because how many of them are ever exposed to this you know many of our guests are a little bit older they haven't been to university yeah. for 40 50 years yeah. um, so suddenly they're seeing the uh, they're seeing a scientist they're seeing yeah. maybe students I guess students yeah. come on board too is that right yeah, uh, yeah. so have students there. It, it's just so yeah. great we're yeah. supporting a, um, a a university field trip 
this year. Oh. So imagine being at uni- you and I oh at university and saying, yeah. Yeah. would you like to go on a field trip to Antarctica? What are you going to say? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> It's that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? What an experience! Right. Yeah. And and you know, um, just to say, because it hasn't been said that uh, you know, for them, uh, you know, if they had to charter a vessel to come to Antarctica, oh, for the scientists, or that, the, for the scientists, yeah. it would be, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, the yeah. biggest uh, locker for Antarctic exploration, even from Scott Shackleton, Charcot to Gerlach, was getting the ship. Mm. So yeah. they couldn't get a ship, and yeah. when they bought a ship, they had to modify it, and then it would take them about three, four years to get there. Yeah. So, and those are the early day, you know, the explorers, but their raison d'etre was the science, you know. So now that it's on hand and we can support the today's scientists, I think it's in, you know, without easy peasy. Yeah. You know, they're there, aren't yeah, they? It's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, your love and pride of birds. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah. when we go, you know, particularly when we cross the Drake Passage, you know, which is this big stretch of water, takes us about a day and a half to two days. It's the it's the big funnel between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. There's this, there's this gap, but that gap funnels amazing seabirds, and we don't see you. What are you yeah. doing for those two days? <laughs> I mean, you come back in after two days, you're wearing a hat, you can only see your eyes, your nose is red. What have you been yeah. doing? And I, I'm lucky that I don't get seasick because that would be terrible if uh, yeah. you were, <laughs> if you were in your cabin for the whole time. But uh, so you're on deck, and basically, you know, the, the the presence of those birds there tell you something about the marine environment in the yeah. area, because you don't think of seabirds like an albatross as a top predator, like a lion or something. Yeah. But in fact, they are. They're top predators in the food chain, yeah. and their existence tells you a lot about what's going on in the water lower down the food chain. It tells you that there's lots of phytoplankton there, there's lots of zooplankton, there's lots of fish, there's lots of squid, and all the sorts of things, krill, all the sorts of things that these seabirds uh, yeah. feed on. So they're indicators um, in that sense. And um, you know what, what we're doing when we're on deck watching these birds, I mean, it, it, it depends on who you are in a way. I mean. Often we get, as you know, we get these um, um, uh, super keen birders yeah. uh, who have never been to any area like this yeah. before, and they're ticking new species off like crazy. Yeah. And because many of these seabirds are mobile, yeah. um, literally, I'm not exaggerating, in the Drake, you could, you have the possibility of seeing uh, seabirds that live in the Pacific, live in the middle of the Atlantic somewhere, yeah. and just happen to be there if you're lucky, and if you put mm. the time in to see them. Yeah. Uh, other people, you know, just want to see an albatross because it's their dream bird, dream of a lifetime yeah. to see this this iconic yeah. bird sailing on yeah. the, on these long wings, eh? And now, yeah. with our citizen science projects, with eBird, exactly. then, then all our birders, and if you're not a birder, you can get into it, yeah. you can do uh, census data, and, exactly. and upload it to, totally. to the World Bank of uh, Bird yeah. Census data, yeah. which I think is pretty incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. It, the database is incredible. Yeah. And, you know, years ago, I, I used to do the same thing. You write down, you're very yeah. proud of yourself. You're writing down all the things in a yeah. notebook and you yeah. keep the notebook in your pocket. But where does it go in the end? It goes on a shelf somewhere, yeah. collecting dust. Yeah. And now all these these data, these yeah. observations are being yeah. used. And so the other one's happy whale, which is amazing. Happy whale. Yeah. Every humpback whale's tail fluke is a different pattern, like our yeah. fingerprints. Yeah. So you can take a photo. You can ask our science coordinator on board, our marine yeah. biologist, will help you upload it to the database. See where that's been spotted before. People before you, people afterwards, will be able to you know track that whale yeah. through observations. Yeah. Ted Cheeseman. Ted Cheeseman. You've got to give a lot that, of credit to that. Him. Um, that data, you know, on that and the, the that's recognizing from the photograph and that database, it must be yeah. massive now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it always reminds me of CSI. You know, when they're doing all these things <laughs> in the yeah. crime yeah. scene investigation, yeah. but when they're matching fingerprints yeah. and matching other things. But I mean, that's literally yeah. what Ted does yeah. now in his group, right? Yeah. They're, they're computer matching 
because they've got way too many to actually do it visually, just yeah. the, the human well, It used touch. to be photos. It used to be photos, yeah. and they'd be yeah. like this, and they flipping through books. Oh, yeah. there it is, you know. Yeah. And now it's done by yeah. computer. And yeah. I just got, uh, just three or four days ago, um, I got an observation of a humpback whale that uh, I'd seen in Antarctica, yeah. and it was seen in Ecuador. And it's like 25 years, or 20 yeah. years, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's um, really that's, amazing. It's yeah. great when you get those <laughs> notifications if you picked up. Yeah. yeah. But I think what, what is fantastic, and one big change in the last 20 years, uh, for Hertz Group at least, is we've now got a foundation. So as a, yeah. as a guest or anybody can give money to the foundation, and the, the board of the foundation will, be, will look at grant applications. And some of the projects we've supported have been Happy Whale, um, save the albatross who so supported yeah. lots of yeah. projects yeah. the scientists to really give back to the areas we sell so it's mm -hmm. i think it's fantastic that you know happy whale from you know our guest benefit we've been able to give mm. back to happy whale just as one example um but i think those that interaction with the foundation on board we still do uh which has been a sort of mainstay has been an auction so you know midway yeah. towards the end of the trip we do an auction auction a chart um, so it's great. So yeah, yeah, that was that was fun. The auction um, exactly on Manson yeah. last week when yeah, I was there. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, you had yeah, one, of yeah, course. Yeah. yeah, so it was good. So I mean, that, that's that's been and stayed in a yeah. really good way to give back yeah. and it's to support these places. But what one thing we can't forget though, as well, is thinking about the albatrosses. Once you get down to the peninsula and to Antarctica itself, mm. then you're confronted by this uh, amazing wildlife experience. And I think I've been going to the Galapagos every now and then, and people are quite familiar with how tame wildlife are there. Yeah. Right? It's sort of almost iconic, uh, one of the few places on Earth. But Antarctica is another of these yeah. places where, you know, a penguin, um, we have distance, distance restrictions to yeah. penguins to protect them and make our yeah. operation sustainable, uh, five meters or 15 feet. But they don't understand that, and they will often walk towards yeah. you and walk by you and they and they they don't seem to care that's great yeah. <laughs> it's amazing yeah, yeah. so this yeah. in your face wildlife experience uh, in antarctica is is uh, yeah. is not easy to find anywhere yeah. else but i think what a place though i mean it is just you yeah. know it's captured you know it's been yeah. the biggest part of my life yeah uh, and, and and my heart you know yeah. but it is just it is incredible yeah and I think as well, we've talked about all the amazing mm. things down there, but as well, the harshness of it, right? Yeah. The, you really get a feeling this yeah. is a tough place and you start to appreciate how the animals down there, how do they survive down yeah. there? Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's cold, it's damp, it's windy, it's dry. Sometimes many of the, yeah. many of the times it's, it's a, it's and a we, harsh place. And, and what hasn't changed is we always talk about plan A. So we have, we have a plan yeah. that we'd like yeah. to stick to. Um, but the, the big control is the weather. So then it's plan B, sometimes plan exactly. C, sometimes yeah. plan D. And, and that's always, that's part of Antarctic operations, which one makes it fun, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes I remember, you know, guests saying, oh, it'd be really nice to experience a rough, you know, we call it the Drake Shake or the yeah. Drake Lake. And we said, be yeah. careful what you wish for. <laughs> but, but having um, having that variety, you know, when you experience the harsh conditions and really windy, you know, in a way, those are the memorable days oh. when you go onto a landing and you're like, oh, yeah, it's really cold. Yeah. 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 So, John, we've, we, you know, we've talked about it. We've got some great questions from our, from our audience. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, we'll ask each other some questions sure. and we'll go through it. What is your favorite bird? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good one. And, um, you know, in, if thinking about Antarctica, uh, it's, it, some people would say it has to be a penguin, but for me, it's the light mantled albatross. And did you expect me to say that? I did. All birders, <laughs> all birders say that, you know. <laughs> It's this yeah. amazing gray, dark gray albatross. Mm. And when you look closely, it's got this powder blue line on the lower yeah. mandible right here, right? And these amazing eyes, it's... And, when, and when, they, when they fly in pairs, they're synchronized flying. Yeah, they do, of course. It's, yeah, they're doing this... It's uh, gorgeous. We haven't yeah. really talked about South Georgia, but of course they breed there. Yeah. And they've started to breed on the peninsula in, we, in a couple of places. Last week, we had quite a few flying around the ship. Oh, down down there. We're in the Drake. Oh, that's neat. 
which, okay which yeah. you don't usually get no yeah no yeah i've seen them uh flying over hannah point so they, yeah. i'm pretty but sure they're on livingston yeah. island there breeding yeah. Yeah. um yeah. Yeah. yeah and i have one for you um and it it involves the all the stations that we see down yeah. there and we do visit stations every now and then uh, and you were involved in a british one why are they there yeah. I mean, why do governments put scientists in Antarctica? Yeah, the and as part of the Antarctic Treaty, Antarctica was designated a continent for science. So as part of the International Geophysical Year, nineteen fifty-seven, fifty, yeah, 50, 50, yeah. late fifties, yeah. um, that was a real push to try and understand Antarctica, and 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 that kind of started the the data. So countries that were really serious, if you like then they, they realised they needed bases to do research. So the most, most of the bases there are hubs for science. Um, and, but then as part of the Antarctic Treaty, if you want to be a consultative party, if you want to be a part of making Antarctic legislation, you have to have an overwintering Antarctic science base. Oh, OK. So you've got so to stay over the winter. So you've got to stay oh, okay. there. So that's your way of contributing yeah. to, to the continent for science. Yeah. So there's a number of different bases. And then a lot of things I was involved, but you know, when we first met, you were, we were going to Port Lockroy, mm -hmm. which is now run by the Antarctic Heritage Trust. So they're, they're abandoned bases, and they're now historic sites and monuments. Uh, and in the early days, when you didn't have planes, you, the ship transport wasn't as good, then you, bases were built to survey a particular area. So they would look mm -hmm. at the, they would map it. I mean, Antarctica wasn't mapped. So there would be aerial uh, aerial mm -hmm. photographs, but then you've got to ground truth those. You've got to see what the wildlife. So that early mapping mapping and exploration was was so why they're there, and that's why there's so many um, uh, huts up and down the peninsula. Basically, yeah. every hundred miles there was a base. Uh, but now it's the main the main hubs okay, um, and different right. nation different nations, and there is a lot of collaboration between different nations now. So the Antarctic politics and history is a whole fascinating subject in itself um, and you think the Antarctic mm -hmm. Treaty I think is only 14 pages it's a small oh, treaty really? anyway really it's really wow. small done at the height of the Cold War yeah. so it's incredible yeah that when you think now to get a treaty on marine protected areas is, is really tough yeah so uh, you know China or Russia blocking it or, or whatever the politics but then the treaty was signed and done and that's been the, yeah, the yeah, base exactly. so incredible yeah, yeah. John, I've got another question, and uh, you know some of the pictures, you know, photography, and you take some amazing pictures. What would you recommend to somebody going in terms of photography? Somebody that's into photography or wants to get into photography. Yeah. How would you guide them through preparation and on a trip? Right. Um, I I first say that any sort of equipment is fine. Um, you know, yeah. you don't need to bring a big lens and a big camera body with you you always do uh, I always did but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know a lot of people these days bring in iPhones yeah. and, and phones and they're getting fantastic results so yeah. that, I mean you know just being there is mm. is is most of the battle yeah you know um, and that that reminds me as well and I'm sure you've experienced too you know, when the, you have the flight down to South America and then the crossing of the Drake Passage, it's been days and suddenly you see the first part of the Antarctic yeah. Peninsula and you realize how long it took you to get there. Yeah. Um, one thing, the light is incredible down yeah. there. Uh, so watch for light, especially early in the morning and late in the day. Yeah. I know you're tired. Uh, guests will be tired. We're all tired when we're down there, but, but uh, look for those those early morning yeah. and, and, and early morning, by the way, can be, you know, quarter past four. <laughs> the sun or is two. up, or three, or two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it can be quite early. Um, and the other thing as well is, it's a, what makes it quite challenging as a photographer uh, is is the contrast down there, because mm. of the contrast of light. Yeah. So you have lots of white and you have dark penguins against yeah. a, a, a snow bank, let's say, or an ice, yeah. um, a, a glacier behind them or something like that. And that becomes, but there are ways of doing it, ways of, of uh, accomplishing uh, the, 
the, the or, or fixing the problem, I should say. And we've got this incredible photography program on our ships with yeah. professional photographers on yeah. every trip. Yeah. And they really work with the guests to make yeah. sure they bring home the best yeah. memories they can. So, so yeah. ask a man that knows, or a woman that knows, yeah. and say, ask the photographer and say, how do I take that? Exactly. Yeah, and and yeah. Yeah, use the resource there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But taking those memories away and being able to show That's your kids, so your friends. So people. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, fantastic. I wanted to, I had something I remember you mentioned a while ago, Tudor, um, that caught, caught, caught my attention when you said, uh, and it's the perspective with the Antarctic Treaty and that sort of thing, that the Antarctic basically is a big wildlife preserve or yeah. reserve. Wildlife and, reserve, yeah. And it, it, yeah. when you think of it that way, it's amazing, right? Yeah. Not only the size of it, but, mm. but, uh, but, the richness of it, what's down there, and how powerful that is. Yeah. Yeah. And being a good Brit, you know, it's 52 times the size of Britain. Yeah. <laughs> 52, I mean, imagine that. It's massive. Yeah. The size and exactly. scale of it is just, and um, we, you know, on, on, our, on our voyages, we're lucky, you know, we think we see a lot of it. Yeah. But actually, we're just touching the edge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, we're going by ship, and Antarctica exactly. is a massive continent, so we're only seeing the coast. But it is on the richness is mainly on the edge. Like Absolutely. you've been on the ice yeah. cap, have you? Yeah, yeah, Do you yeah. see anything on the ice cap? Like not in terms of wildlife. No, I mean it, maybe um, the skewer or something. Yeah, odd or... skewer and <laughs> um, the Antarctic petrel. Oh, which okay, is yeah, fantastic. yeah, flying yeah. in. Oh, sorry, yeah. snow petrel. Yeah, snow petrels. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but no, not, much. not much. Not much. So it's really around the periphery. That's where the life is. Yeah, yeah. that's where the food is. Yeah. And the exactly. Life. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. 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 